Absolutely. So my PhD was at the University of Reading in 2010, um, and it's called uh, Body Art, Body Modification as Artistic Practice. And I'm really interested in actually the metaphors of art, right? So how these we all understand this vernacular phrase body art right in terms of what it means uh, in tattooing body piercing sometimes cosmetic surgery gets rolled into that as well and um, it kind of makes some kind of intuitive sense right i think we all kind of understand it's the production of a mark on the surface or in the creation of something out of the out of the body's raw materials um, but not really uh, many art professionals or any art professionals really have, have really thought through what this might mean you know for art practice and art theory how can we think about tattooing uh, as an art form? If we do think about it as an art form, what are the consequences of that for kind of the ways tattooing is normally understood? Um, so for example, one of the really interesting problems is, is the question of authorship. Because most academic writing about tattooing uh, presumes tattooing is, uh, if you like, authored by the person who wears the tattoo. So there's lots of things about meaning, about the con construction of identity, about the expression of deviance. Um, completely elided in that the, those discussions which come from academic um, anthropologists and, and um, psychologists and uh, uh, medical professionals um, is the role of the tattoo artist and when you start thinking about that and how tattoos are actually produced and how tattooists talk about their work and exhibit their work in their portfolios and the relationship they uh, they um, undergo with a client and how that um, eventual work is produced, you end up with a much more complicated story. And it's a story which I think our history as a set of disciplines can make more sense of than these other kind of more medicalised disciplines. And um, the other the other thing that this this artistic metaphor, uh, when, you, when you pick at it, you reveal is that again, for most uh, intents and purposes, for, in other academic uh, uh, disciplines, tattooing is a phenomenon. Right, so it gets written as, you know, why would you do that to yourself? And then a whole kind of squeeze, whole books about tattooing, uh, you know, all tattooing as a kind of phenomenon, right? Every tattoo is the same phenomenologically. Um, whereas from our, histor our historical point of view and almost from a common sense point of view, someone hand poking themselves with, as my old bus driver did, a Wham logo, um, and someone traveling to Switzerland to see Philip Lou to get a whole back piece done, they're not the same thing, and they're obviously not the same thing. And the motivations are different, the, product, the systems of production are different, the, 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 um, the reception of them uh, are very different. But um, if you read a lot of academic writing on tattooing, you, you don't get the sense of that kind of broad, what I want to call kind of art historical or visual cultural difference. Um, so so that, that was what the work was about, really probing at that metaphor of art. Well, I think these shows are interesting. I mean, they have a lot of precedent in a way. Um, there have been tattooists who've been exhibiting their work in galleries, you know, in those kind of formats that you talk about, photography, um, uh, prints, drawings, um, occasionally even artefacts of the tattoos themselves, stencils and, and prints and things. And um, that's been happening at least since the 1980s. In fact, there's some, some examples even earlier than, than that. Um, but I think actually what's interesting about the shows is that they, uh, there's a rhetoric about, around these shows, right, which sort of say tattooing is, is artistic. Now, um, what I think is quite interesting about those shows and why, why I think occasionally, I mean I really love the, um, the Somerset House show, it's fantastic and the work in it is incredible, um, but it doesn't actually feature any tattoos in it. Um, and so the actual kind of artistic status of the tattoo itself on the body in the world um, is something which I think is a, a, a more interesting and a much more difficult problem. I mean, this is something I, I've written about as well in my PhD, um, because I think if we're going to take tattooing seriously as an art form, um, then we have to kind of understand it as an art form outside of these kind of contexts. You know, it can't just be art if it's hanging on the wall of a museum. Um, I think, I think, uh, what I, what I find really interesting is when the responses people have to tattooing in the world are actually really similar to, to the responses people have to other forms of art making and we can theorise those without worrying about it being in a museum or not. Um, and, I, and I know a lot of tattooists are kind of sceptical of institutions um, and worried about what being in a museum says about, about, the, about the practice. 
Um, that said, I think it's really important. I think it's really, really good that the talents of these people, these artists, are, are shown, right? That, that, that we can hang these things on walls and exhibit and say, hey, look, you know, there's a huge range of stuff. There's a huge volume of stuff. Um, but I think really what's most fundamentally interesting, actually, for me, is the tattoo in the world, right? And the kind of experience of uh, seeing tattoos in the world, um, whether or not they're inside a museum or not. There's a really good um, example of that. Uh, there's a great gag in Punch magazine, 1915. So, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and it's <laughs> the images of all these kind of uh, guys with their shirts off, big curly moustaches, standing up on uh, platforms. And then people, are, there's sort of a crowd and they're peering at the, the people on the platforms. And uh, they've got guidebooks and it says underneath the caption, it says, uh, simultaneously with the private view at the Royal Academy, the Royal Society of Tattooists opens their summer show, right? Um, so this idea of tattoo, tattoos as an art is not a, new, not a new idea. It's 100 years old. But what I love about that image is in the, in, in the picture, uh, there's a sergeant major who's not part of the exhibition. He's not standing there with his shirt off, but he's rolling up his sleeve to show someone in the someone in the crowd his his tattoos, and that kind of shows uh, sort of exhibits that actually the idea of a you know Royal Society of Tattooists having an exhibition is, is kind of a gag, but the idea of seeing tattoos in the world and appreciating them aesthetically and in all the ways that we uh, we uh, understand other forms of art um, is probably you know, a much more rich way of thinking about it. And there's also of course. Yeah, so that's um, again something that's got a nice uh, deep kind of set of precedents, um, possibly back into the 1980s. But there's a good uh, example. I mean, actually, well, people have been getting tattoos of artworks since there's been professional tattooing. So there's a really famous tattooed lady in London called Emma de Berg, who was an American, and she had the Last Supper across her back. Um, <laughs> Uh, one, uh, one commentator reported, because she'd put on a bit of weight, that it made Jesus a bit fat as well when she was showing off. Um, and there are examples of people getting tattoos of constables and of uh, Joshua Reynolds portraits and stuff um, throughout the 19th century. Um, in the uh, early 90s, in 1994, there was a show at um, a little independent gallery in Hackney called the Roadside, uh, uh, Roadside Attraction Gallery. And they got loads of artists, including um, Vim Delvoir, Sarah Lucas, uh, David Shrigley, um, several of the kind of other YBAs were involved as well. And they produced uh, basically drawings, sketches for tattoos, and they were they were tattooed um, on 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 canvases, on hum on human canvases, so to speak. Um, and then they were exhibited in the Barbican, where the people who had the tattoos sort of lined up for one night and they did a private view. And so that's been sort of going on for, for you know, 20 years. Vim Delvoir, after that, did a really famous uh, piece called, um, which he called Tim, where he tattooed the back of a, of a Swiss guy, actually, um, called Tim, Tim Steiner. Um, the tattoo was done by someone else, but Vim signed it. Uh, and then um, they sold the piece to a German gallery for 70,000 euros. Split, split the profit. So Vim, Vim Delvoir, the artist, got 35,000 euros, and Tim got 35,000 euros on the condition that he now has to stand around in his underpants a couple of times a year at the behest of the collector. Um, and there's great photos of him standing next to a label with people sort of peering at him. Um, so again, yeah, this idea of, uh, of, of artists sort of producing tattoo designs is, is again not, nothing new. Really interesting because it does also complicate the kind of medium of the tattoo because, um, you know, this is almost the same problem that, we, we, that, that the, uh, the Somerset House show has. Is it the image that's important? Is it the, um, or is it the kind of, is there something about the materiality of the tattoo which transforms uh, a particular image into something different? Um, there was a case uh, in um, Oklahoma about five, six years ago where there were quite, some quite restrictive zoning laws on where tattoo shops could be opened. And um, the, this artist uh, sued the city uh, on saying that they were interfering with his free speech rights, that he, his First Amendment rights to be an artist, and they were locking down on him. There was some precedent to that back in the 80s. Another tattoo artist, a guy called Spider Webb, had tried something similar. Um, he'd been uh, banned from tattooing in New York because of a hepatitis outbreak, went and tattooed in front of MoMA, right, and dead, uh, rang the police, called the police, 
tried to get himself arrested, got arrested, went to court. The judge threw it out and said, you know, um, uh, if tattooing is an art, that doesn't even even if it is an art, and I'm not sure it is. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we should allow that to overrule other concerns of the city. But sort of 20, 25, 26 years later, this case in Oklahoma went to court and the defence on behalf of the city was, if this guy's an artist, why is he, why is he not just selling t-shirts or doing posters? You know, what, we're not interfering with his artistic practice because he can still draw on whatever he wants, just not skin and not, you know, within X hundred metres of a church or a school or whatever it was. And um, the judge actually said in the case, you know, there was something materially different about a design on skin uh, and a design on, on paper or on a t-shirt. Uh, and so that was kind of, the, the, in essence, the, the, the ruling that overturned the, the zoning laws in that particular jurisdiction. And I think that's really interesting because, again, it gives you um, something to think about because actually, the images themselves, there are whole books about tattooing um, which don't, which, academically about tattooing, which have nothing in them about the images, right? Where these images come from, where they're produced, how they relate to broader visual cultures, and actually what them being tattooed on the skin does, right, as a, as a process. So um, I think uh, we have to be sort of careful at just sort of uh, reifying any artist who sort of, you know, scribbles on a bit of paper and then declares it to be a tattoo, because I think there's something, um, uh, something more interesting about the relationship between a tattoo artist producing a work designed for skin in consultation with a client, um, which you don't which you don't get by just transferring an image, um, you know, that, that's just drawn on a different medium onto the skin without any of that kind of you know thought. What is so this um, sense of perception of tattooed people is something which uh, really interests me as a historian. Um, mainly because it's such a kind of common, it seems like such a common trope, you know. I uh, work primarily on the, uh, what I call the professional era of tattooing. So the late 19th century, when tattoo shops first opened um, to the present day. And through that whole period, and actually to be, to be honest, even before that really, but certainly since the 1880s, newspapers, tabloids, in many cases, the exact same tabloids that we have today, the Daily Mail being a prime example, um, are writing stories about how tattooing is a brand new thing, about how everyone's doing it now, um, about how uh, women are getting tattooed, about how it's fashionable, and actually always in with that, about how people are going to regret it when they're older, how the fad's nearly over, um, and how awful and barbarous it is, right? So this, these two strands about how it's new and exciting and fashionable and cool, and also how it's kind of awful and degenerate and worrying and terrifying, uh, run in parallel for the whole period we have for professional tattooing in this country. Um, which makes it quite difficult to kind of answer the question as to whether or not it's, it is really more popular or not. Um, because if you believe the newspapers, it's always, been, it's always been new, right? Which obviously that doesn't make any sense logically. Um, I've taken to sending journalists who write those articles uh, examples from a hundred years ago. Um, some of which get quite annoyed when I do that. But um, so what you have to try and do is work out from other kind of sources or read between the lines and work out how things have changed. Now, um, I think certainly uh, the low point for British tattooing in terms of its um, social acceptability is the late 1950s, actually, right? Um, during World War II, um, it's certainly the case that tattooing was very, very prevalent amongst um, enlisted populations primarily, but also in the general population. Um, uh, the uh, ca uh, captain of the submarine fleet, a guy called George Creasy, had a big tattoo on his neck, back of his neck, um, which is immortalised in his, uh, his, his, his sculptural bust at the National Maritime Museum. Um, but, tatt but tattooing after the war, uh, people came back from the war and, and tattooing became, by the 50s, very associated with um, a particular class of person, um, lower class people. And the reason for that is because it's sort of a visibility problem. If your bank manager has a tattoo on his back, on his leg, on his arm, you will never see it because you, when you meet him, he has short shirt sleeves on and a blazer. If your gardener has a tattoo on his arm, you will see it. And so primarily, I think, due to a visibility problem, the, upper, the, the kind of upper ranks of the British military that got tattooed a lot during World War II 
their tattoos sort of you know faded into 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 um, uh, not, not into history so much as they faded from view. But the people who were after the war sort of hustling on the streets and forced to work in manual professions, um, you know, uh, were the ones whose tattoos you saw. And so a perception developed um, during the 50s that tattoos were for a certain kind of person. Um, linked in with that was a kind of general trend in visual culture towards modernism, towards, you know, streamlined, uh, towards the removal of ornament. You know, it was fashionable to yeah, you know, there wasn't so much kind of decoration, there wasn't so much chintz in, in everything from, from architecture to furniture. And so generally kind of this idea of decoration, you know, fell from favour. So these two forces, plus as well the stigma of tattooing and the Holocaust, um, of course the kind of, you know, tattooed numbers on, on the concentration camp victims, led to a real sort of decline. And so people who were, who were children, my parents, who were children during the 50s, um, have a really, really stigmatised sense of, of what tattooing is. Now, um, I think that's largely the case, that's largely the persistence of why we still have a sense in general that tattooing is of a particular kind. Um, despite the fact that we've had the same kind of articles uh, that I've just been talking about, the same kind of articles that tattooing is a brand new thing since, you know, all the way through that period even. By the time you get to the mid 60s, late 60s, it's starting to pick up again. There are kind of interesting tattooists in London. Um, but they're having to kind of work in a way that their pre-war counterparts weren't. So tattooists in the 60s, um, they were you know, tattooing teenagers. The um, Tattooing of Minors Act came in 1969 in response to a big moral panic about kids getting tattooed. So it was very fashionable in the 60s, but it, it, it was sort of linked towards with this moral panic. Um, but by the 70s, certainly by the late 70s uh, in America, uh, you have what some people have called the tattoo renaissance, people like Ed Hardy, um, uh, 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 Zeke, uh, Zeke Owens, um, Leo Zulueta, uh, um, not Zeke Owens, sorry, I meant Leo Zulueta, uh, Cliff Raven, um, these guys who are really kind of like, you know, interesting artistically, really pushing the art form. That starts kind of filtering through to Britain uh, by the early 80s. Now, in the 80s, uh, there aren't many tattoo shops in London, but those that are, who exist are tattooing older guys who were tattooed during the war and young kind of kids who, who, were, who were kind of fashionable kids, punk, punk kids, right? Um, and of course that leads to the stigma. And you get, basically this is the rhythm, right? All the way through the 80s, 90s, 2000s, you get these rhythms of um, tattooing kind of comes and goes and styles come and go. When the Into You opened in London in 1990 uh, by Alex Binney, it was in response to all that kind of you know, 80s tattooing. Alex has been to America, worked in San Francisco, worked actually for Ed Hardy, um, and came back to, to London with all this like, cool black work. Alex has been to art school. He's one of the first art school educated tattooers in London. Um, although there was someone before him, a guy called Alan Oversby, Mr. Sebastian, who was, who was an art school guy. But, you know, by the time you get to the 90s, there's this kind of, again, this fashionable move, art school kids. And it's really hard at that point to work out exactly, you know, what's going on. My hypothesis is really that there is and always has been two types of people. People who get tattooing, and I mean that kind of on an empathetic level, and people who don't get it. And if you understand the desire to mark your body, and you, you, if you don't want to get tattooed yourself, if you get why other people do that, um, then you get it. If you don't get it, you, you can, it can never be explained to you. And if you don't get it, it's always going to be weird, always going to be surprising, always going to be shocking, always going to be strange, always going to be slightly horrific because it involves, you know, blood and, and strangers touching you. <laughs> um, and I think that's, re that's really the, the, the story that I think is the persistent one. You know, some people get it, some people don't. Um, journalists are always going to find it surprising. And yeah, there are moments when it comes and goes and it booms and busts. I think basically since, since Really Into You opened in 1990, it's been a continuous, continuous, continuous increase. And there are certainly more tattoo shops now than there have been ever in this country before. Um, you know, back in, uh, back in the 80s, I think uh, Lionel Titchener, who's a tattooist in Oxford, estimated there were you know, no more than sort of 30 or 40 tattooists in the whole country. 
um, there's a great letter with people writing in the 60s and 70s. There's a guy who wrote to his newspaper in Nottingham and said, I really want to get a tattoo, but I can't find a shop. You know, is there one? And the, the newspaper says, we can't tell you if there is one. And someone writes the next week and says, there is one, but I can't tell you where it is. Right. So, th so there weren't many tattoo shops. Now there are you know, loads and loads and loads. So undoubtedly, even though, the, even though I don't really believe this idea that tattooing is sort of not just for sailors anymore, that the demographics have changed, um, the numbers certainly have. More people are getting tattooed now. I don't think probably the demographic split has changed at all because I think there's always been young and old, men and women, you know, fashionable and kind of, you know, interested. I, so so um, that's a long answer to a short question, but I think, you know, I think um, a focus on the, on the demographic or on the novelty is the wrong focus. I think quantity is, is probably interesting and visibility, just to kind of wrap up this, this thought, um, Visibility is interesting because in the 19th century, if you were tattooed, you didn't show it off because you're wearing heavy clothing all the time. Um, a woman called Edie, Marchioness of Londonderry, got tattooed in Japan in 1900. Big dragon on her legs, family crest. No one saw it because if you're a Victorian woman, you don't show off your ankles. Um, by the 30s came round, um, skirt lengths were a little bit higher. And she, people were sort of shocked to see these tattoos on her legs. And there's a similar thing now, as it's becoming more and more acceptable over the last 20 or 30 years, clothing has become a lot more casual at work. People, can, people you know, can roll their sleeves up at work. And tattooing is becoming much more visible. And, and, so, and actually now also, in the past sort of 10 years maybe, there's lots more tattoos on hands, necks and faces, which I don't think are acceptable yet in a general sense. I think you're still going to struggle to get a job in, in lots of professions if you're as visibly tattooed as I am. Um, but certainly it's the case that you see tattoos a lot more now than you didn't before. Well, I think, you know, tattooing's generally been, I mean, overwhelmingly been a kind of young person's game. I think, you know, there are certainly, all, and I think that's the reason why, you know, 100-year-old granny gets tattooed, it's always been a news story. I mean, it's not a, it's not a new news story. There's examples of that, you know, a long way back but it's certainly been a kind of young young person's um, endeavor but I think that's that's sort of in a way fairly obvious isn't it because it's it's when you're in your youth that you're experimenting with your identity and you're experimenting with your kind of aesthetic and you know most people kind of you know the haircut they get when they're about 25 is the haircut they stick with for the rest of their lives more or less I mean you know certainly if for men that's the case um, so I think in general it's, it's been it's probably I haven't got any specific figures on that, but it's probably skewed uh, younger. Um, but it's not, not always been the case. I mean, certainly the, the, the bigger tattoos, the more um, what I want to, you know, the kind of things that I'm really interested in, the big, what I want to call artistic tattoos, and you know, the very interesting back pieces and things, they're expensive. And they always have been expensive, right? Um, again, to pick an example from the 19th century, you know, people were buying season tickets to their tattooists. You know, they were spending tens and tens of pounds in the, in the 1880s and 90s to get big tattoos. Um, and so, you know, that requires a certain amount of capital. So I think you'll find the people that are very heavily tattooed are probably in their kind of, you know, late 20s, early 30s. Most people who I know, men and women who are very, very heavily tattooed, who aren't in the tattoo industry, uh, tend to be, um, you know, in, in their kind of 20s and 30s, because that's just when you can afford it. It's a really good question. I think um, people often ask me why people get tattooed on their backs, you know, because you can't see it. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what the answer to that question is, really, other than to say that in the same way I think that, you know, plenty of art collectors will buy things and lock them up in vaults, you know, it's certainly a step ahead of that. Um, I think most tattoos, for most of tattooing's history, have been, let's call them semi-private. I think there's an assumption, and certainly among the commenters on newspaper websites, that tattoo, people who are tattooed are exhibitionists. But that's, of course, what we might call the toupee fallacy, right? You only, you, you only think toupees look awful because you're never going to spot a good toupee, right? And in the same respect, you know, you, the only tattooists you're gonna, visible tattoos you're going to see are on people who want to show them to you, right? Now, my tattoos are very visible. I'm quite happy to have my sleeves rolled up. If your bank manager has a tattoo on his back, to come back to that, um, if your bank manager has a tattoo on his back, you're not going to see it. And so, but someone will, his lover might see it, 
or his family might see it. Or he might look at it in the mirror in the bathroom and never show anyone himself. And for most of tattooing's history, um, at least what I want to call the contemporary history, modern history, that's how tattoos have been. You showed them off to people who you show your skin off to, um, but you weren't showing them off to the general public. So they're, they're, they're semi-private, they're semi, semi I think. Um, much more so than, than uh, might be otherwise assumed. Well, it's great, you know, I, um, I, I love tattoo. I, I mean, I do what I do. I'm an academic art historian. I teach about contemporary art, performance art. Um, I teach that stuff and I'm into art because I love tattooing. And it wasn't the fact that I got into tattooing. I got into academia and then got interested in tattoos as an academic subject. It was a completely opposite way around. I've loved tattoos all my life. Um, and it was loving tattoos that sort of drove me to wonder where they came from and what they were all about and to try and find stuff out. And the more I looked, the less I found that made sense to me, um, which has sort of led me on to this research career. And um, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, I think in a way, uh, you know, and rightly so, lots of tattooists and people who are into tattoos are very skeptical of academia and academics, you know, writing about what they do. Because uh, I think most of the time it's been quite voyeuristic and quite exploitational, um, uh, quite exploitative. And I, but, um, and, and certainly I'm sure some people think even what I'm doing is unnecessary. You know, tattooing doesn't need me to defend it. And I don't, I don't want to kind of make the case that I want to, you know, I want to say tattooing is art. You know, it's been ignored for, for so long because that's not, that's not the case. What I want to do instead, I think, because coming at it from how I do, you know, being heavily tattooed, having at least some access into the tattoo world and, and, and being, being able to chat to tattooists who are willing to show me things that they wouldn't otherwise show other people and be willing to kind of put the work in um, where other academics maybe haven't done that before. Um, because a lot of the stuff that I, I, I research and write about isn't in public collections, it's not in archives, it's in you know, people's sheds and, and the back rooms of their tattoo studios. And to get access to that stuff, you have to have a certain you know, you have, they have to trust you. Tattooing is, again, a very kind of closed world in lots of ways. You know, for all its popularity and for all its you know, visibility, it's still really a kind of old school guild in lots of ways. You know, it's, it's taught by apprenticeship, by apprenticeship. It's passed down from person to person. Um, it still has its foot in some interesting, you know, interesting areas of kind of social practice. So it's hard for academics to get into it and so I feel really blessed actually that I'm able to put something back into the, 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 the world that I love so much and it, it's so nice when a tattooist says to me I really appreciate what you're doing and thank you and I can kind of show a tattooist you know something that I found and to have them be really thrilled about it um, and it's a real privilege and it, it's really nice to know that every day you know really um, I mean, my job really, and what all academics do, and it, there's lots of um, stuff around it, but really what we do is read books and then tell people about them. You know, find stuff out and then tell people about them. And I love being able to, 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 to go and sort of say to people, hey, you know, everything you thought you knew about tattooing isn't, isn't right. And when I, I do talks to places like, I mean, recently I've done quite a few talks to rotary clubs, right? These clubs full of people the same age as my parents, these people who were born in the it's just after the war and you have a particular sense of what tattooing is and when I can say to them hey did you know you know Edward the seventh had a tattoo or did you you know are you aware that this is how you know tattooing's always been and this is the and actually these things you think about tattooing aren't quite right and it's really nice to have people come up to me after those talks and say I never knew that that's really interesting they might still hate tattooing and they certainly will never get one themselves I'm never going to convince someone and neither, nor do I want to who hasn't got a tattoo that they want one that's not a possible task but um, you know to have to have someone say i didn't know that you know is kind of what i do this for